Altruism is when one individual gives up some or all of his or her personal reproductive potential to increase that of another. Altruism in social insects presented Charles Darwin with very special difficulties for his fledgling theory of evolution by natural selection. Evolution by natural selection required that individuals survive and reproduce. Those that out-survive and out-reproduce uh, others, there are characteristics that they have that cause them to be able to out-survive and out-reproduce, but then increase in frequency in the population from one generation to the next. This is what we call evolution. So for evolution to occur, evolution of traits to occur, individuals had to survive and reproduce. So how do you then explain the occurrence of sterile workers, workers who don't reproduce? and queen castes, so individuals who are differentiated, distinct from the other individuals who can't reproduce, but then the queens can reproduce. So how, how do you get this kind of differentiation of individual phenotypes in a colony if the workers can't reproduce? He dealt with this at length in his chapter on objections to the theory of natural selection as applies to instincts, neuter and sterile insects. How can altruism evolve? That's a question. It's a question that's been floating around for, well, ever since Darwin, or even before. Um, the answer is written in the calculus of inclusive fitness. And for the ants, bees, and wasps, the mechanism of sex determination. The sex determination system that they have gives them benefits that we measure in, in the context of a term we call inclusive fitness, and therefore altruism can evolve. Oops, go back here. Uh, on the right, you see the, the cartoon where these animals are jumping off this cliff uh, and they're falling, but one of them has a parachute. And this very much depicts the difficulties of the evolution of altruism. The, back in the, early 1960s, I believe it was, Walt Disney Productions produced a, a nature film that had one of the scenes where these little animals called lemmings, and they're about the size of the palm of your hand. They live in the Arctic tundra, and during the periods of the year where the, the tundra is covered by snow, they live under the snow, and they feed upon um, grasses and whatnot in the tundra. Well, during this time, they reproduce like crazy, and they expand their population enormously, and sometimes they eat up all their food. And when they eat up all their food, they go on mass migration. So they'll, millions of them will be migrating in these huge uh, migratory herds, um, and sometimes they get to, to a place where, like this, a cliff, that um, they then run over the cliff and they fall down into the water and drown. So this is what Disney Productions was saying was happening, that they were, they were committing suicide. They were deliberately killing themselves to thin the population because if they didn't thin out the population, they would then over-reproduce and over-eat their environment and the species would go extinct. So they were doing this for the benefit of the species. Well, it never even happened. D Disney Productions faked the whole thing for, for this image that they had of the limbing suicide. And, but the big problem is exactly depicted there by the one limbing that has a parachute. So let's say that all those individuals committing suicide, they have some genetic disposition to sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the species. So they jump off the cliff. When they jump off the cliff, the genes that they have, the genetic information that they contain to commit suicide dies with them. However, an individual who has um, a, a genotype to cheat, in other words, not to commit suicide, when they jump off the cliff, they're gonna survive. So what's gonna happen from one generation to the next? Well, individuals that have that altruism trait, they're gonna die off, and the ones that don't have the altruism trait, they're gonna survive. So you can see that the evolution of that altruistic trait, um, limbing suicide, will never happen. The answer to evolution of altruism 
is written in the calculus of what we call inclusive fitness. And for the ants, bees, and wasps, the mechanism of sex determination is one of the key features of their particular calculus that has allowed the, uh, the, the hymenoptera, that's the ants, bees, and wasps, to evolve very, very advanced uh, social systems that have very advanced degrees of altruism multiple times in many different lineages. The ants, bees, and wasps, which are known as the hymenoptera, that's the insect order hymenoptera, have evolved the most advanced societies many times. And this sex determination system that we call haplodiploidy enabled them to evolve this level of sociality. What we're most familiar with is the sex determination system that we have, and it's diploid. Um, we inherit uh, one set of chromosomes in, the, in an egg. So, our, so our, in our mother, she has meiosis that takes place when her eggs are being made. Each egg gets one set of chromosomes. She has two, but each of her eggs gets one set. And th those, that one set of chromosomes will pass into the next generation through the egg. But also associated with uh, this individual here, is a set of chromosomes from their father, which is sperm. So the sperm and the egg combine and they form an individual who has two sets of chromosomes. Now, your brother or sister, the same thing occurred. They got an egg from their mother and a sperm from their father. Each of these had one set of chromosomes, and so now they have two sets of chromosomes. Overall, the relationship between your brother and sister or your brother and your brother the genes that you share in common represents about 50%. So if I went in any, any particular gene, if I went into this individual here and I reached into her genome and I pulled out a gene, the chances, the probability that this individual here would have a gene identical to it inherited from a parent, in other words, by descent, is 50%, 50-50. Haplodiploid sex determination system, on the other hand, like you have in ants, bees, and wasps, is different. Males are derived from unfertilized eggs laid by the queen. They don't have a, a, a sperm fused with them to form a zygote. They are individual, just one set of chromosomes, and it starts dividing and forms the, the, the individual that becomes a male. So their number of chromosomes is N. They only have one set. And that's 16 chromosomes in a honeybee to a set. The female, on the other hand, she gets chromosome, a set of chromosomes from her mother, a set of chromosomes from her father. She has two sets of chromosomes. So she has twice as much genetic material in the beginning stages of development than do the males. This sets up some interesting asymmetries of the genetic relatedness, meaning the number of genes shared in common, or the likelihood that an individual that you take in a nest, in a family, has a gene identical to yours that's been inherited from a parent. It changes the whole, the whole calculus on that. For example, this shows the kinds of asymmetries, the asymmetrical genetic relationships that occur uh, within the hymenoptera. You don't find this in, in diploid species. So let's just take this as a, a, a honeybee family, and let's assume the queen mated with one male, and, and all the female individuals here um, uh, are derived from the same father. If you take a diploid, if you look at the relationship of the queen, to her female offspring and her male offspring, it's just like you have in a diploid system. Your, your parent, each one of your parents shares half of their genes in common with you because you got half of yours from them and half of yours from the other one. So if you look at that relationship, it's the same as it is with diploids. They're, they share half the genes. So the, the son uh, shares half of the genes that his mother has and the daughters share the same. But now if you look at the, a, a female, a female in the nest, whether it's a queen that got made 
in, in the, during the reproductive season or it's a worker, if you look at her genetic relationships, she ser- shares 75% of her genes in common with her sisters. Not 50% like you and your brothers and sisters, but 75%. That's because of the haplodiploidy. The fact that the father gave the same exact set of chromosomes to every single one of, of his offspring. So they all share exactly the same one in common, but they get 50-50 from your mother. So that comes out to be 75% of their genes shared in common with their, with their sisters. Their brothers, on the other hand, remember they only have one set of chromosomes. They only share half, I mean, excuse me, one quarter of their genes in common with their brother. So there's an asymmetry of relatedness. That means there's an asymmetry of the likelihood, if you raise your brother, that, that, it, that he will share an identical gene in you, say for altruism, that was inherited from your parents. So it's only 25% versus 75%. So in order for altruism to spread, the workers need to be raising more females than males. They need to skew that sex ratio over towards females. If they can do that, then they can increase what we call their inclusive fitness. William Hamilton in 1964 expanded this concept of exclusive fitness. Basically, if you look at the, the fitness, say, in, the ter- in terms of offspring produced, uh, the percentage of the offspring produced that have your genes in them, if you, if you assume that a, a, a mother and a daughter can each produce three offspring, just three, this makes it easy, okay? If the, if the daughter raises only her own, she only has the potential to raise three, and the mother raises only her own, then together, each of them have a, a classical fitness, we call it, of three. However, the daughter has this advantage that she can actually have more of her, her genes pass into the next generation. Uh, genes are identical to her by descent if she actually raises more sisters than her own offspring. So in this case, she decides she's gonna raise one of her own offspring and two sisters. So she's gonna help her mother, she's gonna stay and help her. She can, only, she can only produce three individuals, so she does one of her own. So that makes her classical fitness would in this case be one. And then she's gonna raise two of the others. Well there, there's an inclusive fitness calculation that goes into this. That is dependent upon the genetic relatedness of her to her sisters versus her to her own offspring. And this this particular calculation ends up being greater than one for for each of them. So you sum those up and it's more than two. If you sum across the whole, her contributions, her fitness with her own individual, her own offspring versus her fitness with her sisters, you add it together, she has an inclusive fitness of four. So this is her classical fitness, and this is her inclusive fitness component. You put them together, and she actually, more genes that she has in her will pass to the next generation by raising her sisters. This also sets up conflict over who controls the sex ratio. Remember, the queen is equally related to her sons and daughters. So, you know, she wants to see a one-to-one sex ratio, that she has no reason to skew her sex ratio anywhere else. But the workers have a a reason, an evolutionary reason, to skew that sex ratio towards their sisters. The queen lays all the eggs, and she can control the eggs that she lays. She can control whether they're fertilized or unfertilized. So she goes through and she lays eggs in special kind of cells for males, and those are unfertilized eggs. Then she lays eggs in cells that are for females, and those are fertilized eggs, and she has the control. But the workers feed them. The workers make the decision. They can eat those larvae instead of feeding those larvae. So there's this conflict between the queens and the workers over who has control of that sex ratio. 
Different species have negotiated different contracts. They're often based on relatedness, these asymmetries of relatedness. So if you go across different species of social insects, of Hymenoptera, you'll find different kinds of skews of the sex ratio. You'll find evidence of behavioral conflict between queens and workers, and even workers and workers, over who lays the eggs, who determines the sex ratio. A good example are the stingless bees, which I showed earlier. Stingless bees are highly social. Uh, they're, just, they're highly advanced social, like uh, the honeybee. Um, they're from the, the pan-tropical regions of the world. Uh, they don't have stingers, but that doesn't mean that they can't defend their nests. But in this case, in the case of the stingless bees, um, in some species, the queen lays the eggs that become females, and the workers lay the eggs that become males. So remember, males, your own, their own sons are actually more related to them than their, than their brothers, so the optimal for them would be to raise sisters and, and sons. But they're often not able to raise sons because there's different kinds of behavioral mechanisms that, that where the other workers don't, well, they will exclude workers from laying their own eggs. Um, the paper wasps, the polistes that you see under the eaves of your house and whatnot, um, they often have conflict over who lays the eggs uh, and who determines the, the sex ratio. So, but this, is a, this becomes a physical conflict. Like the, the queen has to enforce it. You know, she's on the lookout for workers that might be eating larvae to skew the sex ratio. And she's also look, looking after workers that might um, be laying eggs of their own, which could develop into males, even though they're not mated. But that would then change that calculus of inclusive fitness. So she's there enforcing it physically. So what do social groups get in exchange for giving up their own will and power? Let's, I mean, take a social insect colony. Take, take a honeybee colony. What are those workers getting in exchange? And we were saying they were getting an unfair deal uh, because they have shriveled ovaries and they're worn wings and it looks like they're not getting anything. Now we know they are getting one thing. You know, one thing they do get in exchange is this inclusive fitness component. So that sort of makes up for the fact that they're, they, they have much reduced reproductive opportunities, but what else do they get in exchange by being a member of the society? The Bill of Rights of our Constitution uh, represents the first 10 amendments. They state explicitly the rights of citizens that are bound together in a social contract by giving up all their individual natural rights and power and will, you, will in return get these guaranteed rights back, the ones that are stipulated in, in the Bill of Rights. They're guaranteed to you. Then we have a constitution that was built up that gives all the governmental structures and everything that are necessary to enforce it. 